Good morning. Good morning. I can never quite tell. Welcome to worship here at Westminster. I'm glad you're here with us either in person or online. Westminster was established as the Spanish-speaking Presbyterian congregation in Santa Fe in 1893. And we continue to honor our heritage by using Spanish in worship. The scriptures are read in English y en español. Elsewhere, Spanish is used without translation. If you do not speak Spanish, I invite you to open yourself to the movement of the Spirit. God is present among us whether we understand the words that are spoken or not. This is also why we invite children to worship. For those of you who weren't here last week, uh, our friend and organist, Marthy, has had a series of seizures. She is recovering at home well. Uh, she reports that so far she continues to be seizure-free. Uh, she will come back to worship with us when she's feeling a bit stronger. Carmen Chavez continues under hospice care. Ray has found a place for her to come here in Santa Fe. She will be moving later this week. If you are able, please continue writing notes to them. They have so greatly appreciated the support that this congregation is showing them during this time. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Grace and the Zainins forward for a moment for stewardship. So um, I'm talking about, we're talking about this morning why we tie to this church um, and really to the church in general. Um, this church, uh, our younger two girls grew up in since they were born and I was always so deeply appreciative of um, how this church accepted them with open arms from, you know, young children. They were invited to be liturgists, um, to light candles, um, the Christmas pageant, um, so so many ways, play piano, they were just um, always invited to be a part of this community and a part of this um, service. And I think, you know, it, it just makes such a big impact on their formation as people. Um, they had the opportunity as well to do so many mission trips, um, experience things that they otherwise would never have gotten to experience, uh, mission trips to Heifer International in Arkansas, to Mexico, to inner city LA, and the list goes on and on. And, and I just think those experiences have been deeply impactful. And I think it's so important in raising children for them to have a sense of being a part of the world and helping um, those who are less fortunate. Ditto. <laughs> uh, I could put it in three uh, points. Uh, as a kid, I was taught to say every time we gave offering, Dios ama al dador alegre. God uh, loves those that give cheerfully. And that was something that was ingrained in us. And even if it was a coin that we could give, we gave it. That brings me to the second one. Uh, it's better to give them to receive, and that has proven in our lives to be such a blessing. And third, I admire what this little church can do, and it gives a big portion of its budget into mission, and that is uh, very, very generous for this little church and congregation. That is what I do, and I hope you do too. As you all know, COVID-19 continues to be a thing, and so our session continues to be committed to following the COVID-19 safe protocols for worship. And while masks and social distancing, which we ask you all to do while you are here, help slow the spread of COVID, it is vaccines which do the heavy lifting. If you have not already received a vaccine, we encourage you to do so. If you are eligible to get your booster, we encourage you to do so. And if you are unvaccinated, we encourage you to worship with us online. 
If you missed them on the way in, we do have contact tracing forms on the back podium. Please fill one out on your way out the door so we can contact you just in case. These protocols are here to help keep us and our community safe. We ask that you abide by them. If you, for any reason, cannot, please continue to join us in worship online. We know that God walks with us no matter where we go, even when our worship takes place on our computers, not in a sanctuary. Durante este tiempo de COVID, seguimos siendo la iglesia, adorando a Dios juntos, aunque no estemos juntos. En Dios somos una iglesia más grande de lo que podría contener cualquier edificio. Gracias a Dios. During this time of COVID, we continue to be the church, worshiping God together, even though we are not all together in one space. In God, we are made one church, bigger than any building might contain. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise for our call to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song. Let all the faithful praise the Lord. Let us worship God. You may be seated. Mark Fallis. Sheila Tripe. John Singleton. Dick Avery.
Andres Gonzalez. Delfina Lujan. Janice Archuleta. Maria Lujan. Carlos Martinez. John Armijo. Carolyn Hart. Eloise Danielle Ortega. Beverly Staples. Maylan Gallahan. Carol Jean Anderson. Betty Miracle. Gary Blank. And we light our final candle in honor of all the saints known to God and beloved of God who we do not know. Hear this blessing by Jan Richardson. The emptiness that you have been holding for such a long season now. The ache in your chest that goes with you night and day in your sleeping, your rising. Think of this not as a mere hollow, the void left from the life that has leached out of you. Think of it like this, as the space being prepared for the seed. Think of it as your earth that dreams of the branches the seed contains. Think of it as your heart making ready to welcome the nest its branches will hold. I invite you now into a time of silence and prayer.
righteousness, for they will be filled. Which means that we are called each week again and again to recognize the ways that we have not hungered and thirsted for righteousness. And so trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin using the words found in your bulletin. Eternal God, in every age you have raised up people to live and die in faith. We confess that we are indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name, but we are silent. You call us to do what is just, but we remain idle. You call us to live faithfully, but we are afraid. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow in your way, that joined with those from ages past who have served you with faith, hope, and love, we may inherit the kingdom you promised in Jesus Christ. Amen. Cualquiera que está en Cristo nueva criatura es, el pasado ha quedado atrás. Todo vuelve a ser puro y nuevo. Amigas y amigos, creen en las buenas nuevas del Evangelio. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. Source of all being, beginning and end, we praise you for those who have served you faithfully. For the sake of Jesus Christ, replenish our hope in your eternal kingdom, that we may have life in all its fullness, unfettered by the fear of death. Amen. The scripture reading today comes from John 11, 32 through 44. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Here is the reading in English. Y ahora en español, la lectura bíblica se encuentra en Juan. Cuando María llegó a donde estaba Jesús, se puso de rodillas a sus pies, diciendo, Señor, si hubieras estado aquí, mi hermano no habría muerto. Jesús, al ver llorar a María y a los judíos que habían llegado con ella, se conmovió profundamente y se estremeció y les preguntó, ¿Dónde le sepultaron? Le dijeron, Ven a verlo, Señor. Y Jesús lloró. Los judíos dijeron entonces, Miren cuánto lo quería. Pero algunos de ellos decían, este que dio, a, que dio la vista al cielo, ¿no podría haber hecho algo para que Lázaro no muriera? Jesús, otra vez muy conmovido, 
se acercó a la tumba. Era una cueva cuya entrada estaba tapada con una piedra. Jesús dijo, quita la piedra. Marta, la hermana del muerto, le dijo, Señor, ya huela mal porque hace cuatro días que él murió. Jesús le contestó, ¿No te dije que si crees verás la gloria de Dios? Quitaron la piedra y Jesús mirando al cielo dijo, Padre, te doy gracias porque me has escuchado. Yo sé que siempre me escuchas, pero lo digo por el bien de esta gente que está aquí, para que crean que tú me has enviado. Después de decir esto, gritó, ladro, sal de ahí. Y el que había estado muerto salió con las manos y los pies atados con vendas y la cara envuelta en un lienzo. Jesús les dijo, desántelo y déjenlo ir. Esto es la palabra de Dios. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All Saints Day is an ancient holiday in the church. It's one of the earliest feast days that we have outside of the celebration of Jesus' birth and the celebration of his resurrection. And in many ways, this All Saints Day idea predates the church. In Gaelic tradition, Samhain was the harvest holiday, one where the veil between this world and what they termed the other world was thin. Traditions of spirits being near and accessible were common. In the 8th century in Western Europe, All Saints became associated with Samhain, and eventually the two morphed into one, and this eventually turned into Halloween. This time of year has long been associated with remembering our dead, in particular, with remembering our loved ones who have died in the last year. Now I can only speak to my experience as a white American Christian, but those experiences have taught me that this particular branch of the church has a hard time with death. We talk around it. We don't want to face it. We try to pretend that the effect it has on us is fleeting. We could write a list of the ways we could say that someone has died without using the word death or died, and it would be about a page long. And we imagine that people grieve on a timeline, one that we can set dates and times to, yet at the same time we lack ritual practices for grief outside of the memorial or funeral service. They're still grieving, people say, sympathetic, but also frustrated. We've somehow decided collectively that because our faith promises resurrection, promises that we will feast with God forever, that those of us left behind shouldn't grieve over long, whatever over long means. That our faith demands that we move forward because they're in a better place now. And that may be true, but it's cold comfort for those of us who remain in the here and now. So I find it comforting and deeply humanizing that here in John's Gospel we see grief. In fact, though this passage is usually referred to as the resurrection of Lazarus or the raising of Lazarus, Almost the entirety of it is focused on grief, on Mary and Martha, on the crowd of mourners, on Jesus, all of them. 
sleeping, we like to jump to the end where Lazarus has emerged from the tomb and the people around him have been commanded to remove the linen bands. When death has been defeated and life restored, and I hold fast to that promise, but that promise is not the only purpose of this story. Mary and Martha, the crowd, Jesus, they're all grieving. We recognize it in their weeping and also in the crowd's sudden rage. Why didn't the teacher stop it? If he's so powerful, why is his friend dead? Grief is a heavy thing to bear, which we all know. It trips us up, appears out of nowhere, sits heavy on our spirits, and then dissipates only to return once again in a rush. I used to think that the stages of grief were a linear progression. You move from one to the next to the next, and then at the end of it, you're done. I know better now. Last April, my grandma died. There is still a strange surreality to even saying that, although it has been almost a year and a half. She was in fragile health and opted to stop dialysis rather than run the risk of getting COVID-19, which would have certainly been a death sentence. She wanted to die on her own terms, and she did. She said over and over, I wish everyone could die like this. It was as good a death as anyone could ask for at home, surrounded by family, quiet, amazing care from a hospice team, a peaceful end to 10 days of decline and 92 years of life. And I'm so grateful for that and for those 10 days that brought new meaning to the phrase love feast I am also devastated by the loss. I don't think I will ever not be. Just a few hours after she died, I wrote an account in my journal of the vigil that we kept that day. And after she died, I made the extended family calls for my mom and her siblings. And then I went and sat on the back steps of my parents' house with my dog. Here's what I wrote. What a strange place the world is. Grandma is dead. The sky is blue and all the bulbs she planted are starting to bloom. I sat on the back steps with my dog and watched two bald eagles mate overhead while a crow tried to chase them off. And my grandma is dead. Two days later, I wrote about bursting into tears at the local hardware store as I bought trash bags so that we could donate her clothes. Two days after that, I wrote about my parents driving to Missouri to bury her ashes and how I gave their kitchen a deep clean while they were gone and almost ordered her favorite takeout for us to share and cry while washing baseboards that were permanently splattered with her morning nutritional mocha because she was too stubborn to let us help her bring it to the table. Those baseboards have been splattered for 10 years and driving the rest of us crazy for almost that long, and yet washing them away felt as if I were erasing her from the house. This is where Mary and Martha are when we meet them in this story. Deep in grief, deep in the strangeness that is the fact that the clocks do not, in fact, stop, that life continues, in the forced reckoning with their own mortality, in the initial gut punch of loss, which is always momentarily tempered by the mundane things of life. Too many people have been there in these last 18 months, 
Though we may never have a full accounting, over 5 million people have died from COVID-19. Statisticians tell us that in the United States alone, 2020 saw a 23% raise in deaths from any cause, over a quarter of which cannot be attributed directly to COVID-19. This kind of collective grief is hard to comprehend. Our support systems, official and unofficial, are struggling. So many friends and families have not been able to gather to celebrate the life of their loved one and collectively mourn their death. And each individual doing this in the midst of this collective grief. Hello. And so today we said their names, the people who we know and love and have lost. We lit a candle for each one of them. We rang our bell. We made a public acknowledgement of our losses, our griefs. Because this is what those of us left behind need. Recognition that our grief is heavy and real. A public space to say, this one mattered. This one is loved. Jesus weeps in this story. He doesn't just weep. In the Greek it says he was embremisato, moved with anger in spirit, and etarexen, troubled or agitated. Lazarus mattered to Jesus. John 11, up to the point at which our reading began today, is about establishing Jesus' relationship with this family, with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, described as he whom you love. It opens with Jesus being alerted that Lazarus is ill and announcing to the disciples that first that Lazarus is going to die and then that he has died. Jesus and his disciples travel to Bethany, which is where Martha comes out to greet them. And throughout John's telling, Jesus seems strangely unmoved by the illness of his friend, his disciples are clearly distraught. Thomas suggests that they ought to all go and die with Lazarus. Martha is grieving. Mary is grieving. Many people have come from Jerusalem to mourn Lazarus. And yet it is not until Jesus arrives at Lazarus' tomb that the full weight of what has happened seems to occur to Jesus. His friend has been dead for four days. And yes, we know from earlier in the chapter that Jesus knows what will happen, that Lazarus will be raised from the dead, but even the sure knowledge of the resurrection does not stop Jesus from grieving in the present moment. Because you can't have a resurrection without death. And death is not something you move past easily, even when you know it's coming, even when perhaps it's only a faint possibility on the horizon. And so Jesus weeps, weeps with Mary and with Martha, with his disciples, with the crowd gathered to mourn. He weeps for Lazarus and for those who love him. And perhaps he weeps for himself, and what he knows is soon coming. And it is Jesus' grief I find most comforting here. Not Lazarus' resurrection, but that we have a God who weeps with us. In the mid-1990s, Sally Ann Morris and Thomas Troger collaborated on a hymn titled, God Weeps With Us, Who Weep and Mourn in the wake of the death of a friend from AIDS. The hymn deals honestly with the range of emotions from grief and reminds us that God, too, weeps. 
You can read the verses in your insert in your bulletin. And the first verse imagines God weeping with us as we weep and mourn. The second verse offers a slight shift. As we sing, we imagine that our own grief is but a taste of the deep griefs that God has felt through the ages, of the questions and prayers we hurl at God in the midst of our own grief. The third verse goes like this. And yet, because like us you weep, we trust you will receive and in your tender heart will keep the ones for whom we grieve. While with your tears our hearts will taste the deep, deep core of things, from which both life and death are graced by love's renewing springs. This is why Jesus' grief is so central to this story. It serves as a reminder that we follow the one who mourns with us. The one who came as flesh and lived among us, fully human. This one who knows intimately the trauma of death and the weight of grief. Who hears the names of our loved ones and gathers them up who offers us a glimpse into the heart of our faith. In life, in death, in life beyond death, we are not alone. God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. For those of you who are here in the sanctuary, 
You are invited to drop your offering in the plate on the communion table as you leave this space. Let us pray together. Redeeming Lord, we continually seek your comfortable refuge. You deliver us from our unfounded fears and provide us with miraculous examples of your love. In response, we offer these gifts. We pray that these funds will provide an outreach that warms people with your resplendent love. As a church community, we exalt and praise your holy name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Thanks and praise to you, O God, creator and lover of the universe. You created all that was. You nurture all that is. You imagine all that will be. You are the pattern of community, three in one God of mercy. From the beginning of time, you have created us for relationship with one another, with the earth, and with you. When we reject your call to community, choosing isolation over partnership and brokenness over healing, you call us back again and again with words of grace and the promise of new life. Remembering that we are not alone at this table, we join our praises with all the saints whom you have called from all times and all places, who forever sing your praise, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna, in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, in the highest. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our host and our guest at this table. Through his birth, you took on flesh, affirming the goodness of our bodies and our world. Through his life, you took on suffering, sharing the truth of hope in desperation. Through his death, you took on death, revealing the depth of your love for us. Through his resurrection, you brought new creation embodying the promise of life everlasting. On the night before he met with death, Jesus came to the table with those he loved. He took bread and praised you, God of all creation. He broke the bread among his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, given for you. When the supper was ended, he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to you, God of all creation. He passed the cup among his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup, gifts of the earth through which you bless us and we offer ourselves in your service. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, O God, and upon these gifts of fruit and grain, that we may taste your goodness, see your presence, and become one with you and your body. Gathered at your table, we join all your saints who have gone on before us, and remember them now before you. In life and in death, we belong to you, our Alpha and Omega. All thanks and praise to you, O God, holy three in one, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray for God's kingdom here on earth, using the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Father Nuestro, que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga tu reino, hágase tu voluntad, como en el cielo, así también en la tierra. El pan nuestro de cada día, danoslo hoy, y perdonanos nuestras deudas, 
como también perdonamos a nuestros deudores. Y no nos dejen caer en tentación, mas líbranos del mal, porque tuyo es el reino, el poder y la gloria por todos los siglos. Amén. Jesús dijo, Yo soy el pan de vida. Jesús dijo, Yo soy la vid, ustedes las ramas. Come to me and never be hungry. Believe in me and never thirst. The feast is prepared. I invite you to partake in it. You should have received, I wrote instructions so I wouldn't forget how to do this. You should have received a communion cup on your way in. If you do not have one, please raise your hand and we will bring one to you. To open your communion cup, first, Bend the tab down, it'll snap. This should free up the top little cellophane bit. Pull that off, take your wafer. And once you have done that, you should be able to open the rest of the cup. Do it slowly or it will spill all down your front. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Thanks be to God. 